what I was started thinking about first for this exhibition was actually this addiction to narrative. I was aware, for example, that the Game Masters exhibition was going to be on at the same time. And there's a lot going on about talking about how cinematic narrative is starting to change and how uh, the narrative of gaming is starting to affect everything. It's the dominant visual industry now. Um, you know, and we we're all aware of how, people, how absorbed people get in games, how we always have got absorbed in stories, whether it be a book or a movie or a game. Um, and, but there's that adage, of course, you know, that, that, that it's not the quality of the story, it's how it's told. And I'm trying to look at that contemporary art narrative um, and that sort of mindset that one comes to a contemporary art exhibition and somewhat disrupt that and create a more of an individual curiosity-based investigative impulse that is really, um, you know, try and circumvent the need to look to the curatorial essay first. You know, really just go for full-on process of discovery in the hope that there's more individual experience, more individual ideas of narrative built up, but then in the end kind of deconstruct that narrative. I mean, there's nothing here finishes. There's a work called Quest, which is quiet. It doesn't make any noise. It just works away. And it's sort of a very rudimentary going back to the source of animation where everything's about, you know, because all film, everything's just a series of stills. And it is a very obvious series of stills. It sort of relates to the gaming crowd a little bit because it's just me undertaking this quest. You know, all gaming narrative seems to be some sort of quest. And it's me endlessly, it's just an animation of me running, jumping the occasional barrel, climbing the occasional ladder, and sort of valiantly going nowhere. Um, and that sort of to me is sort of between this old, rich visual narrative to a different sort of rich in a completely different way sort of narrative structure that things seem to me to be trending towards. Anywhere and here um, is the ACME Commission work. And to me, it was, we are in this moment where the cinematic narr narrative is starting to change and I'm questioning the visual clues and the sort of way that these narratives are working. So in this work, I'm sort of, to some extent, honouring but also deconstructing certain cinematic tropes to me that have, you know, sort of stood now for a couple of decades at least. Um, you know, definitely referencing the kind of the road movie cliche, but then you have, you know, philosophers like Deleuze saying that all cinema is the American road movie, you know, whether it, no matter where it's made or what it's about, it's really just an American road movie. Yeah, I think the tenor of it was set by, um, there's one scene as a chimney um, belching smoke. And so I kept drawing this sort of, um, you know, sketching what that scene might look like, you know, and it's this cinematic trope that um, it sort of has this durational thing, it's about, you know, it's used in movies when, a, you know, a character's going through a period of hard working personal growth or something, you know, you'll have plot element, time passes, time passed is shown by chimney belching smoke and then you see the character again and they've come through this period of having to sort of work through something. And I guess that became emblematic for me somehow and it did set up the character of the way the scenes are and the, the key, you know, I hacked a kid's keyboard to do the film score as it was and I'm not a musician. So I copied some chords off a terrible YouTube clip of how to compose a song for keyboard. I think the whole character of that all sort of fits that particular image. Uh, what, I can't say what exactly drew me to the profession apart from that sort of innate desire to be an artist, which goes back to being a kid, uh, like so many. It's, there's nothing sane about wanting to be an artist, I don't think. That doesn't make, there's no logical aspect to it as a career choice. Uh, my own personal trajectory has led through um, being an engineer, being uh, kind of a dropout, making pottery for a living, through to then pursuing the art full on. I, once I started studying art, I moved to New York. My studio is actually an old meat packing plant. 
an unusual place for a vegetarian to work. But, um, and it's a cheap space, it's ramshackle. All my studios have been related to industrial process somehow. I've been next to a lot of sweatshops and unusual things, not so much in the artist's building. The coolness I've tended to be on the fringes of industry. That sort of motivates me more, I think. Um, that sort of, there's a different sort of work ethic around these places that somehow keeps me working. Um, and there's a visibility to how things work, I think, around those sorts of environments, which generally New York has, and I just get myself a bit closer to it again. Um, so yeah, I've always had studios in interesting places. In a, in a way, I'd say my process is kind of like a modernist, traditional art process. You know, take the material and see what it will do. But my idea of what the material is, I think if you take a genuine look at contemporary society, the material is now uh, a lot of imported crap from third world countries. Um, and a lot of uh, somewhat accessible technological items and you know, that really is the material of society today. I mean, I think also for artists that still paint and do all sorts of traditional art things, their own process has become so much more modularized. I mean, how many people now mix their own paint? How many people now you know, do this? We're all dependent on this sort of modular makeup. And so I just choose these modules of you know, crap furniture that are generally available to us all that's just, the, that's just the module I choose instead of a tube of paint. And then I try and see what, you know, a bit of technology, a cheap camera and a chair will do. The research is visual. I mean, there's an idea of certain images or certain generated images that I have a kind of a misunderstood fascination for. I don't really know where it comes from. My own visual research is just to conflate everything. I think art's fantastic because you get to conflate everything to be an artist you know it doesn't really everything is input and you just absorb and you just see what happens what comes out uh, it's only when I get down to the specifics of wanting something to happen that I might have to get very specific in my research about um, you know how can I get this to switch on and off and it's like okay I need to learn how to program a microcontroller I need to learn this electronics, I need to do this, and I'll either find people that can help me, but I tend to be, like to be self-reliant, so I usually get some books and I teach myself what I need to know. Uh, in terms of the visual aspects of the research, I might be like, why does this image persist in my sketchbook? Why do I keep coming back to that? And that might get into more like research of cinematic history or something like that as to why um, this particular you know, image is something to render comes to mind. And well, I hope people engage with my work in a way that establishes a desire for investigation. You know, I hope beyond the curiosity and the fascination with the invention and so on that's in it, I think that's possible. I hope that they might experience certain um, moments of narrative desire out of it, like to follow a simple trajectory, even if it's out of the work that's just generating lit text, that it's sort of, um, it might set up a sort of a poetic desire or we might set up a, um, out of some of the scenes here with the car wheel or something, this sort of, you know, begin to set up that desire for narrative that's become wired into us from the amount in which we, in our lives, engage with the technological screen. You know, just try and expose that a little bit and then, of course, fail to satisfy it.